of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So it's back to parables uh, this week. Uh, last week we had this prophecy of the prophecy halfway through the church, well, between Easter and the end of this church year. We have this prophecy of our Lord's prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem, and indeed it was another uh, prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, well, we're back to parables. I think two weeks ago, when I was in Glasgow, we had that quite difficult parable to explain of the unjust steward. This one today is surely much more easy to understand. I think it's also probably, even if people have got a dim idea of what our Lord says in the Gospels and these parables, it's probably one of the more well-known ones about the Pharisee and the publican. And just to put it in context, because obviously that's all we get, the Pharisee of the, uh, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. In St. Luke's Gospel, he's organized it in such a way that it comes straight after the parable of the importunate widow, who's trying to get justice from the unjust judge. Um, and then that one ends with, pray always and faint not. Well, as I say, last week we had the just judge, not the unjust one, and he condemned Jerusalem and the chosen people. That might come as a bit of a surprise, but they were condemned. Um, and then we applied it to the, the, the situation in the world today. Chosen people had a covenant with God and were unfaithful to it. And towards the end of this covenant, flagrantly uh, opposed to the covenant with God. Not in the keeping of minutiae, but in the actual commandments of God. And this is, of course, what we see in today's modern world. <laughs> if you think it is completely by chance that they staged the Eurovision uh, as they did this year, and now the Olympic Games in the way that they opened it uh, just Friday night, you are mistaken. This is the sign of a world that has apostatized from God. And just as the covenant was, uh, well, at various times throughout it, severely punished by God, uh, those who are breaking the covenant in these flagrant and shameful ways will be punished. That's coming. Punishment is coming. You can't do this sort of thing. God is not mocked. You can't do this as the default setting. That's just how it is. Anyway, back to this, this parable. Um, he says... Um, well, he said last week, didn't he? <laughs> when I come back, will I find faith on earth? Well, the answer he's expecting is obviously no. And you just look, open a newspaper or open your laptop and have a look at MSN News. No, or at least not very much. And I think this parable today is a warning for those, <laughs> again from last week, who think that they stand they must take heed lest they fall. So this is a warning for people who are trying to do something nominally Catholic, perhaps. Um, but it's, it's to show that it's not in the bag, as it were. It's not like the sectarians say that once you've um, accepted the Saviour, then you can't lose it anymore. There are examples enough in Scripture, which they say is their authority, but there are examples enough in Scripture to show that that is not the case. You may have a covenant with God, but if you're not faithful to it, you will be rejected. So uh, what does St. Bede say in the breviary today? He is talking about this gospel and saying, we mustn't be satisfied with mere faith. That sounds a bit C.S. Lewis, doesn't it? Well... Mere faith, I suppose, is mere knowledge of the faith. You know the answers to the catechism questions rather well. Or you, perhaps you profess the faith, 
perhaps you're vulnerable in your profession of the faith because it's not about protestations of faith which will impress the Lord. It's works. That's what he wants to see. And amongst these works is humility. That's the key to success. And certainly the problem with the Pharisee in the parable today is not his good works, good deeds rather, but his pride. And that's, I say it all depends on the words. The Pharisee works, the Pharisee has good works, but the key is humility and pride. So we have to sort of match those up. See how that works. Father Hennick was saying to me this week, we discussed what we're going to say on Sunday. And he was saying, oh, this is so difficult to prepare. I have to talk about humility. I thought, yeah, well, you have difficulty talking about it because you are so humble and you don't even realise. Of course it's difficult for you. I have no such problem, however, so I looked in books to see what I could find out about humility. And one of the ones I came across, being fascinated by this idea of France, la France, la fille aînée de l'église, and the Olympics going on at the moment, I thought, are there any famous French preachers who have talked about this? And what do you know? There are quite a few, actually. I did try and read Bossuet, but he's dry as dust. I thought if I stood up here and used Bossuet as the basis for my sermon, you'd all fall fast asleep, which is not the purpose of my few words to you this morning. So instead, I looked at another one who was perhaps not so well known, Bourdaloue, French Jesuit, time of Louis XIV. He is talking, first of all, he starts talking about pride. And he says, pride is a vice which is very difficult to pardon and one which makes us hated by all, both God and men. And, and you look at how he, de he describes it, then. he describes sort of situations where you can see pride at work. It could have been written yesterday. It's extraordinary. In fact, it's, what, 30, 300 years? 300 years ago. So whenever people are gathered together to talk, I mean, this might be... Uh, in the tea break, um, in the office, by the water cooler, as the Americans say. Well, they, they cool their water, not enough to take it out of the tap, like we can in Scotland, because we have the best water in the world. Uh, but they gather around that and, and talk about various things. Or perhaps it's on the shop floor. They might have a mug of tea on the shop floor and start talking. Might be in the cafe after mass. And all gather in there. Um, or any of the online fora, the virtual fora, where people gather together and type rather than, than talk. Um, I think pride is quite easy to spot in other people. That's the problem, isn't it? You can see it ever so clearly in other people. What does he say? If it speaks it being pride. If it speaks, um, it is the director of the conversation. It pronounces its opinions as if they were infallible oracles, closing the lips of all who would intervene in the discussion or propose anything to the contrary. But if it should choose to remain silent, that very silence is even more proud. You've seen this. You've seen this, dear faith. Well, you have. That um, someone is sort of talking about something. It's perhaps something that they know a lot about. They might be talking about ballistics in the present context, or um, sound waves, or something like that. And that, that you know, they don't know very much about American football, or they don't know much about um, embroidery, but they do know about this thing. And so people ask them a question and they start to talk about it. But the proud man can't bear it when he's not the centre of attention. So the bloke starts off and explaining things to everyone and everyone's listening to him. And he's standing there. Mm. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't say anything. He just makes little noises. Mm. Mm. 
or perhaps nods. <laughs> it's so funny, but it stinks of pride. It's terrible. Compassionate smiles. Laughing at a little joke, but not actually laughing, just grimacing with his mouth. A sharp phrase from time to time, as if he were the only one who really understood the matter under his discussion. I think that's, that could have been, that was written 300 years ago. People ain't changed, have they, really? They haven't. Anyway, uh, that's the crassest expression of the vice, whether it's the active one or the passive one. Uh, I would like to talk today, because I'm talking to religious folk, pious folk, uh, about the one that's more common amongst religious people. Uh, can I say, who affect a certain exterior humility? It might not be actually affected, it might be real. But it is sort of, you know, when you're brought up you know, as children, you know, and you start spouting off or whatever, your parents will correct you and say, be more humble. So you, you learn with time uh, how to be humble. And, and that's, it's not affected. It's just, it's just how Christians behave in company. But if there is any pride hiding behind that, there are a thousand occasions in life uh, where uh, it can come out because, precisely, it's the, it's the most sensitive part of the heart. So it, it could be triggered by anything. Um, I mean, you might say that the first type, the border low type one, is more openly offensive. But that has the advantage, I think, anyway, of being so open and so obvious and people can spot it, it makes them look slightly ridiculous. And you can laugh at them because there they are, all puffed up and, 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 and spouting what they think are great articles and actually they look ridiculous because they don't know very much at all. So that's, that's quite... But that has the advantage of people know that. They don't recognise that. The second type, I think, this type for religious folk, it's quite sad, really. I mean, pious souls, <laughs> perhaps even consecrated souls, nuns, priests, uh, pride under the sackcloth and hair shirt. Uh, Baudelieu calls that the abomination of desolation. And I think this is because the great danger with pride is that it robs you of any merits that you might gain by good works. Fasting and alms deeds, for example, which are the two examples that are in today's Gospel. So if you want to keep your merits, it's important not just to be aware of the most obvious type, but also the more common type amongst pious souls, which I'm going to call Pride under provocation mode. It only comes out when you're provoked. I mean, isn't this exactly what St. Paul is talking about in his letter to the Corinthians today? Um, Corinthians, a, a gifted group of Christians, and they've been gifted with quite extraordinary charisms, precisely the, the sort of supernatural gifts which are abundant proof of the divinity of Christ and the religion that he taught. Nonetheless, St. Paul does not conclude that they are thereby perfect. In fact, what he actually says is they are carnal. Carnal, caro, carnis, means flesh. They are fleshly, perhaps some translations have fleshly, what it basically means is they're not spiritual. There is the spirit and the flesh. Spirit is willing, the flesh is weak, so and so forth. So they are not spiritual. They are fleshly, carnal, because of their jealousies and their vanity and their obstinacy and all the other miseries which make it impossible for him to teach them as adults. 
But instead, he says, he has to treat them like children. Um, I, this, this is another modern thing, isn't it, really? With this victim mentality, we have to be very careful of treating you like children. Although our Lord says, unless you become like children, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. But we don't like treating you like children, so we make lots of little rules which you need to keep. If people uh, abuse their mobile devices, their mobile phones, or their tablets, their iPads, uh, then we start making rules. I mean, you do it for your kids, perhaps. You say, well, you're not, using, you're not taking that to your bedroom. Uh, you use it for 10 minutes or whatever and then read a book or go out and play or something. And then you get into various communities, religious communities, it's the same sort of thing. We need to restrict the use of electronic devices. But the problem is not, it's not the electronic device, it's the lack of virtue in the person who has it. Now obviously with children, they haven't acquired that uh, virtue yet. And so you give them these rules to help them do that. But it makes no sense at all imposing rules on adults who behave like children because they're not virtuous and they haven't learned how, um, how it is that you practice self-control. So you have to treat them like children and impose these rules. That's very, very common today. That's a very common thing. So... Um, St. Paul can't teach these Corinthians uh, anything like sublime teaching. He has to treat them like kids. And he says, although you've got many gifts, you are failing to please God, and precisely in the same way as the Pharisee in today's Gospel. I mean, we don't have the same sort of charisms that were granted to the Corinthians, or indeed many of the early Christian communities in the early church. Uh, St. Augustine who's what, 4th century? He mentions this. He says by his time, they died out. He didn't say die out. He says they had become redundant. We don't need them anymore. We don't need them to show the divinity of Christ and his church. What we need now is just to see that the church still exists 400 years later, and uh, therefore that that's miracle enough. We all know, actually, from present circumstances, the degree of corruption and uh, incompetence at the highest levels shows that, that the church would not have lasted 2,000 seconds, let alone 2,000 years, if it were a human institution. It's a divine institution. It was founded by God. So despite all the incompetence and venality, uh, it's still here. That's the miracle we need to look at. You might say to me, well, look at the crisis in the church today. Yeah, that's true. Because I think the crisis in the church today is obvious. It is so obvious. How can people go along to uh, Newington down the road or the cathedral or up to Ravelston or wherever they happen to go? How can they go and not see there is a fundamental and extremely grave crisis in the church. And it seems they can't. They might not like certain things that go on, but they don't see it as a crisis in the church. They see it as, oh, this priest does this, or that priest says that, or he has a skateboard, or he does this. And it, that, that's, that's not what's wrong. What's wrong is the crisis in the church. Now, most people can't see that. And I assume, if you're here today, you can see that. Well, I think that is a great grace. But it can also be a temptation to pride whenever you happen to come into contact with these people who can't see. I thank God that I can see the crisis in the church and I'm not like these people here who can't see the nose at the end of their face. So it's, it's a bit of a danger. Pride is at the, at, the, at the root of all these things. Why do we tell lies? Why do people tell lies? Children tell lies to get out of trouble. I suspect many an adult tells lies to get out of trouble. 
But what is that? It means that you are bad, you did something wrong, you made a mistake, you didn't put someone on the roof, as it were, and now, to, to cover it up, you lie about it. Well, that is to make yourself appear better than you are. You are not good, you have made a mistake, and now you are lying to get out of trouble, but to make yourself appear better than you actually are that you're not the sort of person who makes mistakes. And the other thing, I suppose, is um, we, we actually lie, even when we're not going to get into trouble otherwise, just to make ourselves look better than we actually are. You start recounting stories about how you did this and how you did that. Well, you didn't do it, but you're just angling for praise and admiration from others. So, they're both lies, and they're sort of opposite ends of the spectrum, but it's pride that's at the bottom of both of them. And uh, if we look at the prayer of the Pharisee today, uh, it's an odd sort of prayer, really. It's not a prayer of petition. He's not asking for anything. I mean, you might say it's a prayer of thanksgiving. I thank God that I am not like the rest of men, he says. Well, he thanks God. That's a good thing, to thank God. Why do we thank God? Why must we thank God? Well, by so doing, we are acknowledging that, you know, if we've done something good or if we have something nice, it's not due to us. It's God who's done that. That's why people thank God. Because it all comes from God, and by thanking him, you are acknowledging that. Uh, so we give the glory to God and not to ourselves. Because otherwise there is a temptation <laughs> to be quite pleased with ourselves, really. And certainly to prefer ourselves to others. Even despising our neighbour. As indeed does the Pharisee today. I mean, we might very well be ashamed of the very poor use we make of the graces God gives us. <laughs> tremble, even, as Father Faber might say. He might tremble at the thought of the account we shall have to render him for them. But I think the bit that the Pharisee is lacking is that he doesn't ask for any more graces. He doesn't ask for new and increased graces. Because, I suspect... He's quite happy, actually. He's quite content with what he's got. He doesn't need anything else. At least he doesn't recognise his necessity. And I'm sure that's what leads him to so thoroughly despise the publican next to him. As indeed, we might be tempted to despise the generality of mankind, even Catholics, who seem to have lost the plot. They can't see it. We are very good, but they are a bunch of losers. Well, <laughs> it's important to remember that no one has a right to presume on virtue as if it were something which we've attained by our own merits. Very often, uh, we have sins or even vices, which other people have no idea about. No one knows this. And, and perhaps, perhaps pride even hides it from ourselves. We can't see that. I mean, certainly, scripture, scripture calls pride a cloak for sin. It serves as a cloak for sin for ourselves. I mean, it certainly helps us to see other people's sins very clearly, more clearly, perhaps. But it covers up our own. I mean, we can excoriate the Pharisee. What? <laughs> what are we going to say about the publican? I was talking about publicans a few weeks ago, weren't I? We know what they're like. 
and how they made their money. I mean, we can take him at face value because the parable is from our Lord. Uh, so he's a publican. So the Pharisee calls him an extortioner. Well, that's how publicans made their money. Instead of charging this for the tax, they charged twice as much or five times as much. And they became very rich on it, as did Zacchaeus, for example. Um, he might have been an adulterer. He doesn't say that. But the Pharisee accuses him of it. So he's not really a very good man. He stands afar off, it says. I mean, now obviously the temple was a cavernous building. Uh, he was certainly standing a long way away from the Pharisee. But he's also far from God. His sins have separated him from God. Now, St. John Chrysostom says that a state of sin with humility is better than a state of virtue with pride. And I suppose there are two reasons for that, aren't there, really? I mean, pride destroys all the merits that we have. If we attribute them to ourselves anyway, then we don't get any of the supernatural merits for those works, deeds, um, or indeed the value of any virtue. And the point about humility, recognising your sinfulness, is that it prepares the way for conversion. If we can imagine the two of them going to confession, the wee box at the back there. Who would leave the confessional uh, right with God, as it says in the Gospel? Well, it's, it's the publican, he says. If the publican abandons his life of sin, it makes no sense at all, which I'm sure is the way many people see this parable, that the publican lives a terrible life doing shocking things, defrauding his brothers and sisters, uh, perhaps committing adultery, I don't know about that part. He does all these things and he thinks, oh, I'll just go and confess that before God, humbly. He'll let me off and then I can go straight back to doing it again. <laughs> that's, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. The humility involves a firm purpose of amendment. Uh, I mean, he's got to have that and if he has that, then it's safe to assume that he leaves justified with God. And I think that's what Chrysostom is saying. He can't have a firm purpose of amendment if he has no humility. Humility is the key to everything. What does our Lord say? Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. There you are. Humility is the key. And I think the thing, <laughs> thing about the publican is that his humility is actually a very public humility. The downcast eyes, the beating of the breast. You can imagine the Pharisee would be quite pleased that we have a nice little confessional here because he can go down and whisper, perhaps even disguise his voice a wee bit, behind a curtain and a grill, and admit his sins... But no one else knows about it, even the priest. Goodness, by the time I've walked back to there to the sacristy, I've forgotten everything I've heard. That's just how it is. No one knows. He has confessed his sins in secrecy. Because, and I think he's quite pleased with that, because he thinks no one else knows how bad he is. He thinks, everyone thinks he's a really marvellous man. Everyone admires him. That's how people are. So he'd be mortified if he knew. Everyone was aware what he was like. <laughs> the irony. Anyway, uh, this is self-knowledge which saves. Sinners have departed from God. God calls them. They turn to him and he holds out his arms to them. 
what the publican is saying today is, the greater my sins, the more chance they give thee, O Lord, to show the riches of thy mercy. This is in the introit today, the start, right at the start of Mass. We can see the riches of, of God's mercy. And for that reason, I will not despair, but I will hold out my hands to thee. And this is not just for great sinners. This is for everyone. Everyone can do that. So those are the two examples. But essentially, this parable isn't about Pharisee or publican. We need to be a Pharisee or we need to be a publican. This is an illustration of Christ. That's what it is. Christ is presented to us as our model. Not in his power or his miracles or more heroic virtues, but showing us his great mercy. Pride exposes us to God's punishments and even to grave sin, if we've not fallen into it already. But humility is the key to all spiritual progress to unlock the great treasury of God's mercy and of all graces. So let us show ourselves as children of our Heavenly Father, dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.